let's get uh, ready to roll. So, um, I'm Kaylee Alana Scoggins-Herring. I am the History Center's uh, Collections Manager um, and Archivist, and Laura. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Sorvetti. I work at Cal Poly in the Kennedy Library in the Special Collections and Archives Department. And Laura came up with this great idea of wanting to share this with everyone of uh, some of the options that you have for doing research online. So we're going to start talking to you about some of those options. Um, you can see there on the, our main little presentation page, um, my webs or my email, Laura's email, all those contact things. Um, maybe, maybe don't try to call me right now because uh, my phone is at my office and I am now, <laughs> my office is my home, but we are active on email um, to talk with you. Yeah, and you can call the office, you can call the History Center. Um, it will go immediately to voicemail, uh, but Thomas will be able to uh, send that voicemail to me when the time is there. So Thomas is the executive director of the History Center, just FYI, when I say Thomas, that's what I mean. And so we each have our collections that we all steward and we, Kaylee and I both work with the public to help everyone who comes in to do research to find material in our collections. And so as we've been closed um, since about March, we've been working at home online and thankfully we, are, um, ha we have a lot of digitized material in our collections at both of our places of work. And so uh, we wanted to let everyone know a little bit about how you can navigate our collections and know what is online. And we also are going to share some other places beyond our two repositories, our two uh, collections that you can expand your search. And we're focusing primarily right now on San Luis Obispo County and the Central Coast more broadly. And we're focusing on what we have in our collections that you all can access online. And then from there, we can expand the conversation and hopefully return back to the collections and continue adding more online, but also being there in person as well. Mm -hmm. All right, just to give you a little blurb about the History Center, we were established in 1953 um, in portion with the Dalladay Adobe, which there are options for checking stuff out about that history and visiting us in person now. Boo. Um, so you're more than welcome to check out on our website. Um, we've been in existence since then. We're the oldest historical organization in the county. There are many other spokes that have started to connect to us since then, um, and we've been working on collecting since 1956. So we have a very large collection. And then if you're into the social medias, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at, at History Slow, because I do a lot of uh, uh, the social media stuff, and there's, there's a lot of fun of just historic photos and stuff. And Laura often does a lot of our research stuff, because she's got the research knowledge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> on my spare time, I, they always post photos, like, can you help us identify this? So... I test out my archives research skills and see what we all can come up with. This is all a community work. We're all learning from each other. So it's good to work together. Yeah, there's lots of mad research skills and I've, our organization certainly benefited from it. So you're learning from one of the best. <laughs> We're all learning together. And so uh, Special Collections and Archives is based at Cal Poly in the Kennedy Library. We're open to the public. Everybody is welcome to come in and use our collections. We um, have not been around as long as the History Center, but we have a lot of similar collecting areas. We focus on collecting um, uh, records that have been created by our communities uh, in the Central Coast and in California, and we also steward the university archives, which are the records created at Cal Poly since 1901. We do not have as exciting, well, we have, we have a web presence uh, and a social media through the Kennedy Library as well. And so we've linked there as our website as well. All right, so just to uh, jump right in, um, for those of you who've just joined us, I am Kaylee. I am the History Center's Collections Manager. Um, and I'm going to lead you through just how I've learned about our county's history and how that connects with our county's materials. So just to give you background, when I was at school, when I was working on my, on my bachelor's degree and I was just sort of grasping various pieces of history, I knew the easiest way for me to get a big 
broad history was just to watch a video. So luckily enough, last year, um, C-SPAN, which is the corporation or cable satellite public affairs network, who um, uses oh, a couple pennies from your cable bill to uh, establish a free network. Um, they have a cities project where they go around to every different or series of different cities in the nation. We were lucky enough to have them come here to San Luis Obispo last year. And they stopped by a number of different historic organizations and locations um, just last year. So you can learn more about the Jack House. You can learn more about Point San Luis Lighthouse. You can learn about Native American experiences from a local Native American woman. You can check out Moro Bay's Cola's bookstore, um, Mission San Luis, the Los, Osos, uh, the Los Osos Sewer Project, and so much more. You can also check out specific to the history of the Carnegie Library from our favorite docent, Victoria. And if you want to hear me chatter incessantly and don't want to pay $5 for the uh, Dalladay weekend to or the Dalladay house tour that we do on Thursdays. You can watch my Dalladay Adobe talk on C-SPAN as well. Um, so that's one easy way that you can get a taste of some of the history of the area. Also, I'm going to do a big hit to Joe Caratinuti's history of San Luis Obispo. He's a great researcher at the History Center, and every time he comes in and sits down and just layers of layers of history he just delves out onto my table and I just sit there and just listen excitedly because his his research knowledge is incredible. Um, jumping on to another thing that the History Center produced, um, we have a series about 25 three to four minute walking tour videos of San Luis Obispo. So that history is done through or um, a narration and then tapped onto that a bunch of photos from our collection. So while socially distancing, masked up, all those wonderful health safety things that you can do in downtown San Luis Obispo, you can also pop your headphones in and listen and watch that video. Or if you are very immunocompromised or vulnerable like many of us, um, you can pop open Google Maps and do a walkthrough too. That also is the option for uh, the railroad district walking tour. So those videos are a little bit shorter, about one to two minutes. Um, also great amount of history. And um, I think that they're a little shorter because you're walking a little bit further. And I don't know, that's just my imagination. They were done before my time, but they've got some great information and some great photos. So they're a lot of fun to take a look at. All right, Laura, next slide, please. Thank you. So now that you've walked your way through town or have listened your way through the city's history and you're ready to pinpoint a little more, um, there are a number of um, Sambor maps. So if you go, we're going to talk about those later about the LOC and how you can access those free maps. Um, but we were lucky enough about a year ago to have a volunteer come through who was working on a GIS, global systems processing, whatever, um, project on, um, he was working on a GIS project for Cuesta and he contacted us, wanted to do something. He took the 1886 map of San Luis Obispo from the Sanborn map, which is all done for fire insurance. And he made a story map of it. So he took photos from the collection, matched those to the locations, their present locations on Google Maps, and tells this wonderful story of what San Luis Obispo might have looked like or looked like in 1886 with photos from our collection and with those maps. Now, I guess that wasn't enough of a project for him because Alan Daly, if he's listening, shout out, you're amazing. He then also added on a secondary map. So that 1886 map and the 1891 map, he did a little slide. So you can swivel between 1886 and 1891 and see not only how things have changed, but how what buildings have stayed the same. So in 1886, we had just had a massive fire that burned down the Andrews Hotel building huge building, took almost a whole block of property. Now in 1886 on the Sandborn map, it is a blank slate. There is nothing there. The fire was so huge, it blew out the windows of the buildings across the street from it. So it was a massive fire and nothing was going to be built there anytime soon. But by 1891, there was a new building that had been built and it was called the, ooh, grew, grew, I am, I have terrible pronunciation wheels for words that I haven't re read before but it's called the Grootley 
G-R-U-T-L-I Hotel. And I am by no means a super historian of every single building that's ever been built in San Luis Obispo. So I'd never heard of that one. But I was able to use that name, go into our database, find this photo. And this is between 1890 and, 18, or 1890 and 8, 1900 of San Luis Obispo on that street. So right there where you see Grootley Hotel in the middle back, that's that hotel. And this is where the Andrews Hotel had burned down about 30 years previously. So if you start looking through the maps and you start finding things like that, you start finding building names, start finding locations that you want to learn a little bit more about, we might be able to uh, share that with you. So if you want to uh, bounce over to that next slide, there we go. So right here we have um, the beginnings of Past Perfect Online. So we have an exceptionally large collection. We've got well over 66,000 items in our collection, at least in our database, likely more in the collection itself. But this nonprofit life, um, we are only able to fit in about 10,000 items uh, onto our Past Perfect Online database. And I've gone through, made sure all those are photos, those have research information. And uh, one of our volunteers was kind enough to put together a tutorial on how to do that. If you're comfortable with most online research sites, you'll be able to figure that out. Um, if this is new to you, that's a great little tutorial video to just get you a little more comfortable with the specificities of Past Perfect Online. Um, but otherwise, that's an easy way to do it. Now take our history and our collection with a grain of salt. Um, as you know, um, we are only able to know as much as the person who gave us the photo knew. So in the case of many times, it'll be if, as photos in my, only, in my own family history, if that photo doesn't have a name on the back of it, and I don't know who that woman is, and I donate it to a historical museum, it's unlikely that they're gonna know who she is either. And so we have a number of photos that are unidentified in our collection. This is just a, a little moment of, please, I just recently heard this fantastic joke of um, every time you write the name and date on the back of a photo, a historian gets a year back of their life. And this is entirely true for collections managers, archivists, uh, historians of all sorts. Um, please, of your own collections, write names, write numbers, write all these stories you can add because that makes a huge difference for us. But of the best descriptions with the best photos, um, those have been updated onto Past Perfect Online. Now, of course, because there are only 10,000 of those, that may not fill all your archive library or object questions. Um, I've also added our email to our research team. We're very lucky that our researcher is able to visit us safely in the museum a couple times in the week uh, and socially distance. So feel free to drop an email to him if you have a specific question. He'll be able to help you as much as he can. Um, of course, just give a little bit of time. Turnover is not instantaneous because he only checks that email when he's actually in the office. Um, so Laura, if you wanna switch that over to the, my last slide. So I'm gonna give you a little picture of what it means in our collection specifically. So my job as collection manager, I don't get to do the research side of things because uh, there is so much already to be done with a very large collection. There needs to be data fixing because when you've had a collection that was that started growing in the 50s, you started with writing down all the information you knew about each object person in a session book, big hard copy book. Then you started having catalog cards. Then you started having lists. Then you started maybe getting into the predecessor of Excel, then maybe upgrading to Excel, and then finally getting into a decent database like Past Perfect. Those are a lot of steps where you can lose information or mix up locations and pieces like that. So data management has been a big part of my job, as well as entering in information for every new thing we get. And we are constantly getting new donations. We're constantly having people offer us new items to add to the collection. I mean, just today we had someone call about photos of Camp San Luis in the 1950s. So our collection is constantly growing and that's my side of the job. So I'm not doing the same things you guys are doing, which is finding and collecting and connecting those dots. But when I get to connect those dots, 
it's really special. So this photo, I was doing our inventory. I was matching that online data to the physical item and preparing it so that my volunteers can go back and actually enter in the research, add that information that is really pertinent for researchers. So found that photo, flipped it over. Yes, there are names on the back of it. Back of it. On the back of it, there were three names. First, it was Patrick Nagano. Second was Masatoshi Bill Karata. And the third was Emma Hori. Now, I was really lucky in the fact that I happened to know the son of one of those gentlemen. Now, on the back of the photo, there was no other information about it. Didn't have a date. I was at a loss. So I reached out to my volunteer. And not only did he know that that was his father, he recognized some of the other gentlemen, like one of the other men and young men in the photo. And he said not only was that the first time he'd seen that photo of his father, he'd never seen his father's friend at such young an age. And he shared with me a seven page autobiography of his, ex of his father's experiences right after um, the executive order 19 or the executive order 9066 came out, which is the predecessor to the beginning of the Japanese internment camps. He was able to tell me himself and then through his father's history that this photo was clearly taken before 1942. And his father's history describes how he broke the curfew, the curfew that only allowed him to go five miles away from his family home to go to San Luis to sell the food that his family was growing, which was benefit, benefiting the county, to close up the bank accounts and compile enough materials so that he could move east with the rest of his family because everyone else had already moved east, um, but he was the last one there. He then goes on to talk about how he, he met Bill Carrada in town and they were going out to lunch when they were arrested and they were held in jail for five hours without any word of what they'd done. And then they went to jail and he talks about the racism he experienced, um, but also how hard community members worked to raise enough um, mortgage collateral so that the bond was, um, so he could be released and he could finish up what he needed to do before he moved east. So by finding this photo and by speaking to the person who really had the history, we were able to connect the dots in such a bigger way and really make that those puzzle pieces connect and really tell the whole story. And that's honest, obviously what what we're hoping can be done with all of history, what we know can't always be done. And hopefully by connecting you, our great researchers, with these unidentified or partially identified or portions of information, we'll be able to create that really cohesive picture and really give history the full story. So uh, that's some of the things that the History Center can offer uh, for our researchers. Um, feel free to drop any questions. Um, in the chat box if you think of something while Laura is telling you some of the great things about their collection, but I'm going to uh, take over and share um, my screen so that Laura is able to see her notes, um, which is going to be very important. There we go. All right. All right, Laura, take it away. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Sorvetti. I work at Cal Poly Special Collections and Archives, which is a unit in the Kennedy Library on campus. We are open to the public uh, when we're not uh, shut down. Um, you are always welcome to come and use our material. Uh, while we're closed, we wanted to mention some of the resources that we have online that you can access. And so I'm going to go through some of the materials on our website and how you can find, find what you're looking for. And then mention some of the other resources that Kaylee and I and all of our colleagues use at other repositories as well. So next slide, please. Uh, this is um, what we usually look like. It's, it's all dark and sad now, uh, but we're on the fourth floor of the Kennedy Library and we collect uh, a lot of different areas that we uh, collect records around. Um, but 
for us tonight, some of the focuses are on the Central Coast, and these are usually collections that come from a family or an organization, and so uh, Kaylee can go through. We have, prior to that photo, um, we had the uh, a drawing of Hearst uh, Castle, San Simeon, as part of the Julia Morgan papers, so that's the professional papers of the architect Julia Morgan. Uh, as we will probably say this a lot, but the History Center and Special Collections overlap a lot in our collecting areas and in the creators that donated or their families donated. So they also have records related to Hearst Castle at their archives. Um, we also collect organizations uh, records. So these are photographs taken um, by a farm labor organizer in the Santa Maria Valley of farm labor organizing in the 1960s. Um, you Oh, the next one is hidden, but we also have the Mothers for Peace collection, uh, environmental activists collections. Um, um, we have family records. There is the Sinsheimer family, which Kaylee, uh, they also have records of at uh, the History Center. And I believe another one will show up. Um, we also have records of the Alui or A. Lewis family, the Wong An family on Palm Street, and uh, the History Center does as well. So as you're thinking about doing research, it's good to search all of our collections to see what's out there. And what else is, and then um, we do have uh, legal and um, uh, city records. So we have uh, building permits that document uh, construction on town. So if you're researching a site, uh, there's documentation around sites. And you can arrow the other one. Um, yes, another business records and family records of uh, the women who operated Sisters Inn, which was the first known black owned restaurant in town. And you can arrow to the next one. And then a large part of our collection are the institutional records of Cal Poly, which was established in 1901. So we have photos and postcards. Uh, if you arrow to the next one, we have newspaper, the student newspaper, and then more photos as the next photo will show you. This is the University Union students gathering for a rally. And so these are uh, the types of material we have. And yeah, you can go to the next slide. And uh, we, what we've been doing for about the last two decades has been digitizing our material. Most of the material in our collections are either paper-based photos, letters, diaries, books, or they're audio-visual based. Uh, so here we have a reel-to-reel -reel audio playback machine and our students uh, both here are photographs of our students who do a lot of the digitizing for us and they go in and they use our equipment to digitize these items to make copies to put online. There is a next slide has a another fun one. I don't know how hard it is for you to see here, but we have a local photographer Forrest Dowd who comes in this thing on the floor here is an architectural plan uh, for Dodger Stadium that's part of the Barton Landscape Architecture Collection. So large we could not scan that on our little flatbed scanner. So we also can send things out to be digitized as well. And so we put all of these records on our online archive. This is the home page landing page here that you see and there's a search box where you can search across all of these different collections. You can also browse collections. So if you're interested in seeing everything we've digitized from the Lewis family, you can go directly to that collection. But I usually start here because um, often collections overlap. So for example, uh, in the Sinsheimer collection, there's photos of the Alui store. And so you could browse through and find all of these different collections. We have about 60,000 things that are digitized in our online archive, and they uh, encompass about 200 of our collections. And so how do they get digitized? We often um, work with researchers and they help us identify like, hey, I'd like to use this photo in a exhibit or in a book. Um, other times we've been trying to go in through all of our collections and pick a few photos from or objects from each collection to digitize. So right now it's really a selection. 
I usually say, and I don't mean this to mean don't look at this site, but we probably have digitized only about what 1% or 2% of our collections, Kaylee's the same. It's, it's still a lot of material, uh, but there's more that we continue to digitize. So a thing that I always keep in mind is keep checking the websites you use to see what they've uploaded recently. I'm always amazed. I go to a site that I've been to before and then I find some amazing resource. And then we also have a lot of different formats. Um, the little maps down here, if you go back one, it shows um, the sort of scope of our collection. So you can see the most are in California, but we also have um, Japanese collection, related collections. We have uh, your, some collections with records from uh, created in Europe. Uh, and so you can see the scope of our collections, but as this little map here shows, the bulk are in California and within that, the bulk are in San Luis Obispo County and the Central Coast. And so I just wanted to let you know a little bit about how our collections, we search, how you are searching them. So we are uploading these images to our website. Um, they're being uploaded as TIFFs, TIFF files. So they're all photos or um, audiovisual uh, formats. And so the, com the computer isn't always knowing what to, there's no information for it to keyword search. And so this is an example here of a scrapbook page. It has a little bit of text on it, but in the majority, it's, it's, a, it's all photos on this page. And so the archives staff goes in once they've scanned it, and the, the majority of our time is actually spent trying to figure out how to describe this. And so this is um, the part to be aware of when you're searching to consider um, what are the things that you can search. So if you arrow to the next one, uh, this is what you see below the photo that was displaying. This is our metadata, we call it, and the descriptions we put in for the objects. And so for this item, uh, we've told you, we've given it a title, uh, and then we've, told, we've given it a unique identifier, and the History Center does this too, and so you can always say like, hey, Special Collections, I need this item, and that unique identifier will always connect to that image. We also include the collection it's from. So in this case, it's uh, hyperlinked under collection title. You could click that and it would take you to everything we've scanned from that collection. And then we've added a date and a tip for us when we put circa, it's like we think it's around this time. Uh, sometimes it's like circa 1900 and 1950. And so we didn't do as much description there. But in this case, I was researching um, Thomas F. Nolan, who was a um, person uh, in who was a faculty member who ran for state senate and he uh, we could date it more precisely but sometimes like Kaylee was saying we have it written on the back and if we trust the writing on the back we can add that um, and then we also add a description and so in this case we knew uh, some of the people in the photographs we knew where the sisters Inn was located and we added some additional information so that when people are researching they might pick up these keywords based on how they're starting their search uh, sometimes we can add the location as well. And then on the bottom, this uh, link to the collection finding aid is a link to bring you to a list of everything in that collection. So I think we've digitized maybe 20 objects from this collection, but there's a whole box of material. And so you could go look and see everything in that box and see if there's other things you might want to request to get digitized. So that's what it's searching, especially for photos where there's nothing on the page uh, that we've scanned to search. And so you kind of wanna think creatively about what you're searching to see how to capture, um, to search through what we've included in it. So sometimes it's easiest to browse, sometimes it's good to start with a keyword or a, a place or a name. Okay, thank you. There's two other types of um, searching that our system is doing. If we have something scanned that's text-based, that has been printed usually or typed, the computers now are savvy enough that we can run a program that will actually look at that TIFF image and figure out where the words are. And it's pretty accurate depending on the quality of the images. Uh, and so in this case, this is a business directory from 1901 that we scanned. And uh, it's now I can search across all of our collections and because it's searching the text on the page, it's actually finding the words as they appear in the page. 
So I think this is a great directory. It's, it's pretty tiny, it's small. I mean, it's San Luis in 1901, but they include people's home addresses. They include their places of business. Uh, and this page, for example, they uh, separated out in this directory, the Chinese businesses. And so um, I can go here to this page and see all of the businesses that were included in this directory. And so uh, this also I wanted to mention, uh, I'll, I'll bring this up again, but thinking of the way people's names are spelled sometimes incorrectly, sometimes um, the OCR isn't reading it correctly. In this case, Ah Louis, Ah Louis, Wang An of Palm Street. Uh, is spelled L-U-I-S, and we usually spell it L-O-U-I-S. So in that case, when I'm ever, whenever I'm searching for him, I, I, I search several different names for him based on who the creators are of the documents writing the, inform the information. Okay, and then the next slide shows uh, one other type of search that we do in our archives. This is a handwritten police ledger here. And so the computers haven't figured out yet how to read handwriting. And so this is where we can go in and sort of magically, I think behind the TIFF file, we can add the text that we have typed out for that page. So you can see the page here that's been scanned and then that little red circle, if you click on that text, um, button, it will pull up what's on the left here, which is the text that we transcribed. And so I actually transcribed this page. It took a long time. The handwriting you can see is, is um, elaborate, I would say. And so we had to learn a little bit about the legal system at that time and words. And I, you can see here, and if, if you can get close enough to the screen, there's some examples here where I've put words in brackets. And usually when you see something in brackets, it's your clue that the archives has, or the staff have added that, that we think it might be performed, uh, but we're not sure. We'll add that in if we're spelling out somebody's name that had been abbreviated. Uh, but you can see it's pretty accurate here. We, trans we try to transcribe it exactly as written. So that means you have to search the words um, that would have appeared on that text. Uh, and so you can see here, if you, if anyone has uh, an opinion going to this page sometime, I wasn't sure. It says somebody, ah, and then I couldn't read what the uh, last name was. And so uh, I put it there, possibly Louis. Maybe it's the phonetical spelling of Ah Lewis's name, Ah Louis's name. It might be somebody else and I can't read the handwriting correctly, but this is another example where sometimes researchers are kindly pointing out, oh, that's actually that person's name, or I go and I find another page and I'm like, oh, I see that's an L and so I can edit it. So this is also what's being searched when you go in and do a search of our collections. And so these are the ways you're finding our material, either based on how the archive staff has described it and added the words or the direct text on the page or a transcription of what's there. Those are the basics. And so here are some search tips that I usually use. I usually start with my very specific search. I'm looking for um, Rosa Plaque in the police ledger books. And, and then um, if I don't find a name, I will then, or if I don't find the exact name I'm looking for, I'll try different iterations of the name. Like how else might people have spelled this? Or did the person get married and change their name? Or did they immigrate to California and change their name uh, like Ah Louis? And so that's um, something I start with. It's the same with I'm, when I'm searching a place. So sometimes I can search a specific address and it shows up and it's like amazing. But other times I might broaden it to the street and say like, hey, I just want to see Palm Street. And then if I don't find it there, then I'll start like, is there a tract or a district that this is part of? And then um, what's the city, the county, and start ex expand, uh, expanding. Because like there's photos in our archives where I'm like, I think this is San Luis Obispo. I had it once where it was like, a coastal mountain range with a river in front of it and somebody wrote to me and said oh actually this is uh the curve right here on the gps coordinates of avila as you're driving to the ocean so we're always learning more 
also try different keywords. So you can see we're searching both the words the archives are adding in, but also you're searching the text of the objects sometimes. And so thinking of different keywords that would have been uh, used. So for example, I've been researching the history of sex workers in San Luis Obispo. And so there's lots of different names that you would search in the Tribune newspaper, for example, it was a, um, a hidden history. And so sometimes it was very oblique and I'll show you an example of that. And so you're, you're trying out different keywords that would have been used at that time and that we would use today. And then also being aware of, I already mentioned this, uh, different names that could have gone. So for example, I was researching the Ramona Hotel, which was on Essex Street. And I'm like, what's Essex Street? And so I went back to a map and I saw Essex Street and I was like, oh, that's what is now Johnson. Or Brook Street today used to be Edo Street and it was renamed by the city during World War II in the wartime hysteria. And so knowing the different names of the streets or I know a lot of researchers were coming in to research Montagne de Oro, like what are all the names of the property before then? And then I also wanted to mention earlier, but I got distracted, um, our collections are really focused on about 1850, in Cal Poly's collections, are focused on about 1815 to the present. And they're really focused on English written language items. And they're also uh, historically based on what we thought we should collect at the time or what people thought they should create or keep in their archives. And so there are gaps and silences in our archives that mean that there are histories that are going to be harder to find because we did not collect those records at the time or when we were collecting or they were not able to create the records when they were working. So for example, I often I'm trying to research the Chinese laborers in the county in the 1860s and it, there are very few records created by these men who are labor uh, working here and so where are the other ways I can approach this and and then in addition to that those silences and gaps looking in between and then also remembering that what has been digitized is only a selection so like okay i found this great photo of the sisters in what else does the archive have you know so always email us or ask us like what else do you have on this topic because we love to tell you everything that we know about it and because we've been digitizing and working with other researchers often we're like oh somebody showed me this great thing let me point you to it so those are some search tips I have and and also track your searches so you can remember it and also when you're finding things in our archives or our collections like if you're going to screenshot it or if you're uh, going if you're going to screenshot it or copy the image try to cite it with it so you can always find it our archive we provide uh, small thumbnail images to download from our website and so if you want to use this in an exhibit or you want to print it out beautifully for your wall or put it in a book, you can email us. And if you tell us, hey, I'm looking for this item that I saw and you have the information about it, we can easily get that for you and you can request that. All right, thank you. All this, okay, so this was just one of those uh, things where it's like all of the Venn diagrams of all of our work coming together. So this was uh, the first page of this police ledger book that we digitized. I was so curious, it was a woman and there aren't many women, there, there are more men in these police ledgers than women. And so I was curious, I was like, okay, I wanna know more about her. So I searched her name as I think I transcribed it and I couldn't find her anywhere. And so I started looking, I was like, okay, it happened in January, 1881. And so I actually went to the Tribune. And if you arrow to the next one, I found this little article on page five of the Tribune, a female denizen of the disreputable precincts of Palm Street celebrated New Year's Day by raiding her Chinese neighbors. She was arrested and convicted. I think I found it because I searched police and during that time and I found it here. So we don't have her name. We don't have the name of the men or women that she uh, was um, accused against but we were able to find that reference there. And then from there, I think you've all seen often uh, maybe maps of Palm Street through the years. Um, and so here I've pulled up the, um, I think this is the 1880, I think it's on there, I just can't see it. 
1880s map of Palm Street here. And then uh, again, like code words here, we have female boarding houses on the corner of Palm Street. And what is that street? Uh, uh, I can't read it, Toro maybe? Um, and so um, there is more information about the site that this was happening on at that time. Oh no, I'm getting the cue that we should keep going forward. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, we'll, we'll crank through these. These are other places. So we have our online archives, um, but there are more places. So Calisphere is a great resource. This is where all the, um, where a lot of archives and museum and cultural institutions can uh, add their images. And um, so we can search across many hundreds of uh, collection of different repositories. And so um, this is a great place to start for California based research. So I searched San Luis Obispo and got hundreds of results there. And um, one I wanted to do, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to do a specific shout out here to uh, the public library. They have their, they have some of their collections on Calisphere as well. Um, and so they have uh, a lot of photo based collections here of the community. And so if you're doing research, um, this is a great um, repository institution that you can uh, search on Calisphere. And um, here at Cal Poly, there's also the Recollecting Project, which is um, a project uh, led by Gracie in the Ethnic Studies Department. And she has been working with local community to um, help them preserve their records and digitize them. And so this is a collection you can search as well over, as you can see, 800 items here. And uh, it's a great resource for our county as well. And she's actually trying to figure out like, how can we, um, correct the legacies of the archives and what we didn't collect and missed through the years. And so uh, this is a really important project. Another resource to uh, know about is the Library of Congress, all public domain. You can download a lot of these images straight from their website. Uh, that map of the, uh, San the Sanborn map I showed you came from the Library of Congress and um, they have been digitizing more from San Luis. So here I searched San Luis Obispo and I got 3000 results. So this is a great resource that's not searched in Calisphere. It's, it's the uh, Library of Congress. Um, another website to know about is the Internet Archive. I use that a lot because they've digitized Myron Angel's 1883 book and um, a couple uh, big tomes from the early 1900s. So I often access those. They have videos of films of San Luis Obispo and the county. And they also uh, have the Wayback Machine, which is a web archiving system. So they're actually, since the 90s, I think, have been capturing websites. And so here, for example, is the earliest version of the uh, slowcity.org page from 2000. So I use this when I'm uh, doing research on more recent history, like, hey, what, what uh, has been captured there of different websites of our towns? All right, next, um, maybe my internet, oh, there we go. Yep, Sanborn Maps at the Library of Congress. They have them in color. They have um, for several of our cities. The color is really great. If you're not familiar with the Sanborn Maps, there are these fire insurance maps. So people are trying to figure out like what's gonna burn and what do you insure things for at different things. And so they get down to the building level. And so when they're, and they color code them by like, are they made of adobe, wood, brick? Uh, and so those are really great resources. They're pretty focused on big populated areas. So, um, the more um, um, rural areas don't always have these maps, but they were created from about the 1880s to the 1950s. And the History Center has the real deal uh, physical copies as well. And so I use these a lot. Uh, if you're a Cal Poly affiliate, we also have access to a larger run of them with your Cal Poly login. They're only black and white instead of color, but they, you can uh, see more across California there as well. All right, and then another uh, good resource that's available through Calisphere, but I wanted to point out for all of you who are researching um, around the 1850s and 1860s, the 
Bancroft Library at Berkeley has digitized all of their uh, Desenio collection, which have about 1400 maps, that, these beautiful hand-drawn maps of ranchos. Um, and so we have several, many of our ranchos in our county um, digitized through here and the mission is on there as well and mission lands and so these are really great resources. This is what I think becomes Montaña de Oro so um, you can zoom in on their website and read all of the little hand-drawn keys to the map and uh, those are really helpful. I just wanted to shout out to those maps specifically. All right. Um, another a resource for place-based research are aerial photographs that are available at the UC Santa Barbara Library. They've been digitizing them. So on the left here is a map um, that you can use to navigate to see what areas have uh, map, uh, photos taken. So all those little dots represent a photo that's been taken. And so they go from about the 1930s to the 1980s. Um, and so uh, those are a good resource as well. And then a little shout out for newspaper is I think in the last year and a half, a world has opened up for us doing research. Uh, the History Center has them all in print, so they, they've got it made already. But um, at Cal Poly and just for researching online, there's been a couple of recent digitization projects. And so this is amazing. This is the uh, University of California Riverside has a California digital newspaper collection where they've been digitizing hundreds of newspapers across California. And so just, I think, maybe last summer or so, they uh, uploaded um, the San Luis Obispo newspapers up to 1925. And uh, so this is an enormously useful resource uh, up through the 20s. Um, other cities have their newspapers up. Before they put the slow newspaper up, I would just search it anyways because California liked to talk about each other and so often um, other cities would mention San Luis Obispo so whatever area you're researching it's um it's good just to search across the collections to see what shows up and um, if you're a Cal Poly affiliate we have a separate database uh, through Newsbank that has um, more recent Tribune articles in it as well and so this is also a resource for um, continuing on past the 20s. And then um, for future reference on the next slide, there is, um, I was told by somebody at the Tribune that there, if you, some of you might have accessed the newspapers through Newsbank on your own pay for a subscription. I did that for a while and then they stopped it. And so it sounds like newspapers.com is redigitizing them and adding them to their website. So this is a fee-based website, but it has a lot of um, our local newspapers, like here is the Santa Maria Times on there. I was looking and I saw um, Lompoc and I think Santa Isabel. Um, no, Santa Inez. So I think there's a lot there if you if you want to subscribe on your own and check back to see for the slow. And then Ancestry, um, a personal subscription. The public library had a library subscription, but I noticed for 2021 they had to cut that from their budget. There are some free records on there as well. So the 1940 census and the census, if you haven't used them, are really helpful because they would go down the street writing everybody's names down. Um, what was their profession? How old were they? Where were they born? Uh, sometimes it was like, where did they live five years ago? Who are the people living with them? Um, and so those are a really great resource for um, doing genealogical research or place-based research or anything on the community. All right, so that was cranking through. We made it uh, some of our, of, about a little bit about our collections and also about other uh, places to start your search. Google is another great place to start, but I like mentioning these resources here because these are all places that have been digitizing material and putting it online. And so it's been really wonderful to see all of the access. 
but you're always welcome to reach out to Kaylee and I and say like, hey, I'm researching on this topic. Can you check to, what do you know about this? Because we might know like, oh, there's this thing we recently scanned that hasn't been put up. Or when we get back on campus, we'll take some photos for you of that material. And so we're always adding new things to be that we've been scanning and um, learning more about our collections. And so we welcome you to reach out to us.